What's up, guys? This is Jeremy Worden in the Short Term Rental Pro Podcast. I'm here with Bill Faith, an absolute thought leader, as well as a guy who's just really, in my opinion, leading the pack into the future of the short term rental space. So you guys are going to want to tune in here, listen to Bill's background, how he got to where he is today. And he's going to share a lot of very tangible information with you that will help you either start or grow your short term rental business. Bill, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm really excited to uh, talk some shop with you today. Awesome. So yeah, Bill, can you just give folk who if they don't already know who you are a little bit about your background, how you got to where you are today in the short term rental world? Yeah, I think like with most people, probably my age that were into real estate prior to the boom of 2020 during COVID, I started with long term rentals, I was 22 and bought my first duplex in Bakersfield, California with my winnings from literally my first year of playing professional golf. And just manifested through real estate. I found out about short-term rentals in 2012 when I was at city council in downtown Nashville fighting Uber regulations. I was in the ground transportation space and I kept seeing these bills just about as often as there would a bill come up to try to shut Uber and lift the app-based com- uh, limousine companies down. We'd start seeing short-term rental bills that were coming through too. And that's what peaked my interest. And literally I was having a meeting with a city council person about our bills and he was writing a bill for short-term rentals. And I asked him about it because I owned a couple of condos uh, that I had LTR in here. And, and that was my first foray into short-term rentals or even understanding what it was. I was never, I've never been a vacation rental guest until I got into this educational space. And even at that, I don't like staying at short-term rentals. And we can talk a little bit. And the reason is, is lack of consistency. I'm a huge JW Marriott guy. I'm a JW Marriott and a Hilton guy. And I love the consistency that happens in hotels. I don't like the inconsistency and I've made it very public because I live a public life. I document everything that I do and I've rented some pretty ridiculous ten, fifteen thousand dollars a night properties around the country to host my mastermind in. And every time we're so disappointed because that bar, that expectation sets so high, right? So I think that's one thing that we need to try to really achieve is consistency. And that's something that I've built my guest brand on, I guess, is really trying to build consistent experiences across the board as I've rolled out my portfolio since 2015. So I switched everything from LTR to STR in 2015. First place, Estes Park, Colorado. Second place, Dustin, Florida. And now I'm in Montana. I just put another property under contract in Montana yesterday. I'm in Alabama, down in Gulf Shores, Fort Morgan, up in North Carolina, Banner Elk, Beach Mountain. So I've strategically learned from my business partner and my Glow Golf business to try to get two to three properties in each market, not necessarily for scales of economy because that really doesn't work in trying to negotiate better deals with handymen and cleaners, but just from an ease of operation standpoint. And now I own and also have a co-hosting management business as well. Gotcha. Now, I like how you say that. It's the ease of logistical operations. People always ask me, they're like, yo, why don't you enter X market or Y market or what's the best market? And I say like, you know, at this point, I'm already in five or six. They're good markets. Like, sure, I could probably put a pin on a map in a specific area and say this one is the best place, so to speak. But when you already have the infrastructure in a local area, like Montana, for instance, I'm assuming there's not that many like legitimate operators there. And folk would probably be scared to, to enter a market like Montana. I'm assuming it's more rural. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> no, but- I, I, think you're, I think you're spot on. But here's what people do. And they follow me into markets. <laughs> and they follow other influ. I don't like the word influencers. But I put a property under contract in Kentucky just six weeks ago or whenever it was. And literally, as soon as I announced that I was investing into Kentucky, Tony Boer, who's my agent up there, and she's awesome, She just got throttled 87 people within 24 hours reaching out to her. I just got a text message from Tyler Kuhn when I invested into Banner Elk, North Carolina. I said, dude, do not share this publicly. I need three or four months to, I have 150 grand left on a 1031. I got to buy another property, get this cleared out. Then we can go ahead and make that announcement. And it's one of the biggest things that frustrates me because people really need to invest property to property, not even market by market, and definitely not influencer by influencer. We all have different wants, needs and expectations going into a market. So I have made it abundantly clear that I invested as a lifestyle investment into Whitefish, Montana. I had looked all over from we were talking about Jackson, the Teton Village, the Alpine area up to West Yellowstone, Bozeman for two and a half years. And 
I think people would be crazy if they're going into that market strictly from a financially driven decision, unless they're like within five miles of the entrance to West, the West Glacier National Park entrance. So people don't really think about all these dynamics that go into picking properties. I told you before we started, it's a pretty arrogant comment. I believe I'm the best property picker that I've ever seen. And it's a combination of data, evaluation, value add, and deep research. I'll just give you a really quick example, Jeremy. All my assets at the beach were in Fort Morgan, Alabama prior to COVID. Lower cost, lower hosting, lower reviews, easier. So I brought kind of the 30A, the seaside hosting mentality to Fort Morgan that was about 15, 20 years behind. Golf carts, sups, paddle boards, coffee bars, ridiculous communication, high-end linens, just all this luxury stuff into an old, tired market. Then I shifted all of my assets out of Fort Morgan into West Beach. And even my mastermind members thought I was crazy. What they didn't know, and it's taking place next week, is that Jack Edwards Airport was turning into Gulf Shores International. And I follow city council meetings. I follow re regulatory components. I'm looking for that deeper research to move. If I'm going to move millions of dollars, it's not just because I see a better property. It's because I see a better long-term future. It's funny. Yeah. We had Tyler Kuhn on actually, I think last episode that aired was me and Tyler talking. And, and we talked about how everybody, Destin, Florida, everybody moves into Destin and all of a sudden prices go up. It's oversaturated. And then everyone's like looking for that next spot. And he, I think what's cool about him is, and his, his brokerage is there. I know you talked about Kentucky, so maybe we shouldn't talk about the Kentucky bourbon trail. <laughs> I'm assuming that's probably where, where you, where you looked in Kentucky. Yeah, I think it's a great market. I think it's one of the few remaining year round markets because of weather, because of the attraction to the bourbon trail. But I'll go back to Tyler for a second. The only reason I invested 18, 19 months ago into Banner Elk, North Carolina is because Kenny Bedwell, founder of SDR Insights, found a hole in the market. And at the time, there was nothing large that was being served, meaning 14 guests and above. Yep. The market was almost vacant. And the handful of properties that were there were shitty. Like literally, the average host was 4.4 stars. Everything was outdated, what I call golden girls. So I went and I invested into Banner Elk, bought my biggest property I've ever purchased for a single family home. And it was 1.6 million, have absolutely crushed it. The problem is Jeremy is then I spent that extra 1031 funds going into Beach Mountain. And wow. that's when I announced that I had invested into that market. And so many people followed me into Beach Mountain and the level of rehabs and design and just everybody stepping up their game Tyler told me there was like 480 properties that transacted. And I know how much money I made him following people following <laughs> into the market that we tracked him and I together. And a lot of people are selling now. I'm selling. I'm getting out of the market because so many people followed me into it. It is saturated. The only way to compete because everybody has leveled up their game is to compete on price. I've got mastermind members selling. I have co-hosting clients that are selling. I created my own private group. I'd say 20% of the people in the private group are selling because there's just not enough demand in that small of a market. And that's it's a reality of what's happening in our space now. So we have to be very strategic in that deeper research when we're picking a market. And then most importantly, I want people to know you don't invest into a market, you invest into the individual property. I think you touched on a good point there. So I, I think a lot of, yeah, and obviously I see this, my comments and questions online is what's the best market? What's the best market? It's like the top question. You probably get asked it all the time too. Yeah. But when you break it down and the way, at least I see it. So I'm curious the way you see it is it's really, it's the right property in a market with like good fundamentals and fundamentals, just supply and demand. Like all, you just want a market where the demand is going up over time and the supply <laughs> is not exceeding that. Like it's really a simple math equation. And some, you look at the Gatlinburg, Tennessee's, and yeah, you probably look at obviously Beach Mountain and Banner Elk like that. You can just clearly see, obviously look at AirDNA, that equation's messed up. The numbers aren't there, but there's most of the country, the equation is still there. As the you know? average, it's messed up, right? Yeah. So if you're up here, it's what my mastermind members call the mastermind 30. We do benchmarks every month, right? And they outperform the 90th percentile of AirDNA as a group by 30, 31% and it fluctuates. So what's really important is that if you're gonna be average, you shouldn't be investing into short-term rentals today. If you're yeah. gonna be able to stand out from 
how you evaluate, how you pick, how you renovate, how you design, how you amenity, how you market, then you can ascend past that 90th percentile. And I think people aren't honest with themselves, right? So you, I, I look at Gatlinburg as exactly like 30A, right? It's If you go into Gatlinburg, you got to have the indoor mod pool, which is 100 Gs. You got to have a $50,000 minimum into your two-car garage game room. If you're not willing to do that and you, it's not, it's one of the few places that you really proximity and views aren't good enough anymore, unless you're at the top of Ober and the gondola passes right in front of your house. Right? So I think that narrows down the type of investor that should go into that market. And that's what people aren't real with ourselves. We lie to ourselves all the time. You lie to yourself. I lie to myself about whatever. The problem is, is when we're investing, we better be brutally honest. John Hodge, the bank whisperer, and we talk about this all the time. And we have a saying, don't tell me your story. If you have to tell me a story about your property or about why you're investing, and you can't just hand me a performa and make a financially driven decision, then you should not invest in that property. We've never seen a story tell us except for somebody that knows really what they're doing about how they're going to take a property that's doing a hundred grand and turn it into 150. That can be done, but you better be really good at knowing what moves the needle in that individual market. So we hear, should I be pet friendly? Yes, in certain markets, no, in other markets. Hot tubs are not even an option in the mountains anymore. They are mandatory. So that additional price of ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars has to be factored into your purchase price if it does not have a hot tub. The interesting thing I think is the Gatlinburg market. The strongest, consistently most performing bed count is a two-two. For cash on cash, for cash flow, everybody invests, everybody wants the six, seven, eight bedrooms. But if you look at the consistency over time, and this is where like Kenny Bedwell's data comes into play, right? The rock solid bet is that a two bedroom, two bath in Gatlinburg is going to do between $47,000 to 55 grand with almost no fluctuation. There, it's almost impossible not to do 45 grand. It's almost impossible for somebody like me to come in and push that to 65 on a two, two. So there's like an off market deal right now with six, four twos. It's going to do 300 grand like clockwork, right? So the question is, can somebody add 10%, 15%? Or if they did nothing, what I call like the doctor or dentist, COVID set it and forget it and just build your listings and never do another thing. Can they still do 45 to 50? And I think, Jeremy, that's one of the things that I see is people don't analyze bedroom counts on demand. They just look at market and they look at either single family, multifamily, boutique hotel. They're not really breaking it down by two bedrooms, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and above. And that varies market to market. And when you say, I'm just curious, what would a 2-2 in Gatlinburg run you right now? Or six of them if you're buying a portfolio? I'm not going to comment on this Take individual look, deal because this is something that's in our war room that will g be taken down on Wednesday. <laughs> but I think you're I think you're looking probably around 300K. Oh, wow. Per, okay. Roughly. Because I was just, I don't know why, I just off the top of my head, I was thinking Gatlinburg in general, just everything's pushed north there. One ones even like little mini cabins are I mean, you're, even you're half definitely a mil looking there. Three hundred, four hundred thousand. I can tell you this deal's under four hundred thousand each, and it's probably slightly above three hundred thousand. It'll be under contract before, but those are the types of deal. That's like a consistent safe deal that somebody could invest a couple of million bucks into, generate three hundred thousand. Is that the two hundred thousand per million or hundred thousand per five hundred thousand dollar investment that I'm looking for? No. But is it a consistent property that can yield one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year in EBITDA or cash flow? For those of you that don't know what EBITDA is, absolutely it is. And what is your current equation looking like? So obviously, people talk about interest rates all the time. I feel like from my conversations with those really leaving the space, don't really talk as much about the particular interest rate. But really, if I'm going to put eight hundred K in, I want to make 150 or do you have a specific kind of so to speak, line? 100 grand line, so for every speak? half million, two, 200 grand for every million dollars. That's very challenging today, though. I'm happy mm -hmm. if I can spend a million bucks and get 175 at the interest rates today. And I'll tell you right now, and it may shock people, I'm in the, the most aggressive buying mode I've ever been in my life right now. And if interest rates go up even more, they've settled, right, where I'm getting right around 7% today. 
I don't advise people to be aggressive. If you don't have any money, you don't have savings to back up your purchase. Don't borrow money from mom and dad. Don't do hard money. And these 10% interest rates on DSCRs with five-year prepays, those scare the shit out of me, right? But I can go do a conventional. I can go get a commercial loan with really good rates for today at 7%. It gives me way more buying power. I just put my second property in Montana under contract that should be around 1.7. It's new construction even. And I'm under contract at 1465. It'll be done the first part of August. There is no question. Once it's done, it's in a, a municipality that is highly regulated. It, I can get an STR permit. The CCNR support STR permits. That's going to most likely bring that value to 175, 1775 the day that I close and probably 18185 once we furnish. So those are some of the investments that that I like and it's in a very strategic location. Can I get 20% cash on cash, 30% cash on that property? No, but that is a longer t- as you get into these higher value deals, cash on cash comes down. So there's this kind of this million to probably 1.2 to 1.5 million dollar mark where your cash on cash kind of goes down, but you're generating more cash flow, right? And I think which is more important? I think a lot of that depends on where you're at in your investing lifeline. So for me now, it's much more about cash flow. And I'm looking at cash flow over a 10 year period, not a one or a two year period, right? So there's no question in my mind, if I can sustain my credit worthiness, manage my debt to income ratio, my DTI, that in probably sometime within 36 months from today, I should be able to take this 7% interest rate and get it down to five. And so I'm actually factoring in that equation of if I take the loan balance and get that down to five, what's the difference in the increase in cash flow? I'm analyzing those things in my performa today when I'm looking at these long-term holds. And actually, Tyler and I touched on this that ever, and he obviously works with a ton of investors like yourself being obviously a big one also being one that probably led to him getting a little bit more (laughs) clients. So everyone has different considerations. Some folk at this point, when it was crazy to me, when I first heard that people buy STRs purely for tax benefits, like when I heard that initially, like when someone said that I was mind blown, because for me, it was all cash flow. Like cash flow is what got me out of my job. Cash flow allows me to live the life I want to live. It wasn't tax benefits, but now I'm curious where you're at now. Is it also tax benefits, like buying to, to do the whole cost seg. Is that kind of a big factor for you? I think you, you better have probably 25 to $50 million plus net worth to only buy for tax benefits. Ryan, he says it very well. We, I never advocate for buying just for tax benefits unless you're that wealthy, right? Because then you end up with compromising the cash flow, compromising investing in the strong markets that have good appreciation values over a set period of time, whether it's three to five years or 10 years. I look at really two things. I am not choosing properties ever based on cost segregation benefit. I'm choosing properties based on a combination and it's about 85% cash flow. That's my net income, folks. That has nothing to do with gross revenue. I could give two shits about gross revenue. And just so you guys know, gross revenue includes cleaning fees. It includes taxes, this bullshit of running a business and thinking, oh my God, I have a coffee shop and you know what? I'm not going to factor in the cleaning fees that I have to pay for that outside cleaner to come in and clean my coffee shop at night. Every dollar you generate through an SDR is gross revenue by Ryan would tell you the exact same thing, right? So here's the deal. Number one, 85% for me is going into net income. How much net income, real cash flow can I generate off of that property? The second part of it is appreciation. The cost segregation is the bonus. That's the cherry on top, right? But the only time that you should do a cost seg is if you know you're going to hold on to that property. So I have a large portfolio of properties that I own. About 30% of those properties, the debt, right? You can look at either the number of properties or the debt that I have. I've cost seg them. I've 1031 them, and I even have one property still that has a a DSCR on it, right? So if I'm going to go, if I'm going to use 1031 funds like I did in the Banner Elk, I know I'm going to hold on to that property. So I did do a DSCR through the lender. I got a strong rate. I'm at like, I think 485 when I bought it, 40-year AM. 
or no, what is it? Yeah, thirty year note on a forty year AM. So my cat, my cash flow is significant. Right? But the one thing that I'm doing is I'm looking at the appreciation on that property based on the investment that I will make post close, the ARV. But I'm also being disciplined enough to where I'm escrowing my own principal. And that's something that there are a lot of people, a lot of the DSCRs, since Chris Ledwidge at the lender kind of pioneered it and introduced it, the 40 year AM on the 30 year note, interest only. We can't make extra payments. We can't pay down the principal because that would trigger the prepay. So you need to be disciplined enough to be able to go in and escrow your own principal on the side. So I do that. When you, I'm not more, to cut you off, is that for the depreciation recapture when you sell it? Is that kind of to protect yourself in case you need to sell? And it's, have to it's, pay what I like is I like the flexibility of having an interest only loan, but I, have, I ha must have the discipline to be able to save my principal payments. Okay. So people don't understand, pe most people don't know my strategy. So I used to be the Robert Kiyosaki, let's leverage. And if I was your age, I'm going to be much more aggressive in leveraging debt. I just turned 50 last week. I'm retiring in less than f roughly five years. So I'm trying to go more towards the Dave Ramsey side and pay down my debt. My wife and I do not touch any of the income that we make off of our STRs. We reinvest into the properties to keep them brand spanking new. And we pay double or triple our mortgages. And if we have that one DSCR loan, we can't do that. So I'm taking that Banner Elk, which is a $285,000 a year property, which means I typically operate about 40, 45%. So let's just say $140,000 net. We're putting every penny of that. We keep about $40,000 in operating costs for that individual property for carry costs. We're putting every penny back into paying down the mortgage. Since I can't pay that, I'm actually putting that into a money marketing account that's yielding 4% return. Okay, so you, so essentially your evolution as an investor, short-term rental investor, initially was more swing for the fences, so to speak. And now your priority is not having a large debt load. So five years from now, you can go F off or what is your, just, you're going to tell us what is your goal, I guess, next 10, 20 years. Let's start with swing with the fences. I don't know what that means. So I didn't have the money that, that when I started in 2015 that I have today, I saved for three years $127,000 for my first down payment on a $630,000 short-term rental. And I built my entire business out of cash flow. One of the things that I did do starting in February of 2020, even really before COVID started, but that's when we already were seeing, I'd sold a house in Fort Morgan to move towards West Beach and Gulf Shores. And I was able to sell about $75,000, $70,000 higher than I'd anticipated. I bought a property in East Beach that literally, we, my wife and I were on day three of setting up after close, and somebody came and walked through the property and offered to buy it. And I, pay, if I remember correctly, I think I paid five thirty-five and sold it for six seventy. It was either six twenty-five, but we're coming into spring break, like March and April. I said, okay, we'll do that, but we're doing a sixty-day close, so that way I could keep the rental income. And I don't hold me to this, but I made like another forty k on rental income and then sold it for ninety-five dollars or $100,000 more than I paid for it. Well, then I rolled that in to buy another one. And then I did. So basically I flipped nine properties oh, uh, wow. in 13 months, just in Gulf Shores. By the time I'd sold that property, things were heating up. The market was appreciating at three to 5% a week, not a month, not a year. This was so, into 2020, 2021. Exactly. So I went in, I had the best agent down there, Deb Wood. She's retired now. She was incredible. She was the most trusted. She got me off market deals, kind of like Avery does now for our war room, for the super team. It's having those connections are insane and in what you can do from an investing standpoint. So I built up my cash through cash flow of my own properties that I would buy and hold, but also I did some flipping, which I'd never done before. But there was one key thing. It was like, get in, get it done in a week. That was always the goal. And it was tough for me and my wife because we did a lot of the labor. She's a designer. She would procure. We got two kids, soccer, all that type of stuff. But we would buy a property. We'd get in seven, eight days, done, list it, rent it, sell it, repeat, rinse it, buy it, close it, furnish it, design it, sell it. The one thing we didn't do was any construction. So what Deb Wood had taught me were these retail flips, paint, flooring, appliances, furnishings, designs as quickly as we can. So that way we can generate rent through the summer. 
So I pretty much had doubled my existing portfolio uh, as we went into April, May, June, and July. And in the middle of July, when everything's still hot, is when I offloaded everything. And then I really started leveling up to the bigger properties that I would hold, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of ways. Uh, there's not just one way to make money in this business and leverage my wife's ability as a really good interior designer to add really quick value to those properties. And did you see a premium because you were selling them as effectively turnkey short-term rentals? Yeah, there's a guy, he was in my mastermind. I guess he probably wasn't then named Brandon Thompson out of Atlanta, who was a house flipper. And he was just getting into the short-term rental space. I'll never forget. There was, it was actually in Fort Morgan. We bought a, what was it? A four, four, two for 429,000. We painted, it was white. We painted black trim around the windows, the posts, the eaves. We didn't even put in new flooring, just new furnishings, painted a little bit inside, a couple of new appliances. I think we paid 429 and sold it for 625, like literally 18 days after we had closed. All cash deal done. And we did a lot of those types of deals just to where we could build up our cash so we didn't have to use our own money and then go and redeploy. And then we started by the end of the summer, we're buying million dollar plus properties. So at that time, try to, I call it like the velocity of cash, so to speak. Like that was the quickest way to turn your cash, like turn $1 into $2, two into three. And now you're parking that cash, so to speak. It's still gaining in value, but it's not as much about you kind of recycling it. I've hit all of my financial goals. So one of the big things is if you remember my session I did about building your outcome at the STR Wealth Conference. It's a 45 minute session that takes two days for me to teach somebody at like our couples retreat or when we were in Montana. And I learned from my mentor if you remember that first day, I don't know how many people were paying attention, but I almost started crying on stage. I got to introduce John Bairden, who was sitting in the front row, who's retired. And he's the one that introduced me to building out a life plan, right? And I built this whole planner off of it to where I hold myself accountable daily. I grade everything I do. But most importantly, I've defined retirement. That's a definition. And even when you're at your age, you should define what retirement means to you. It will change no idea. Bunch, many different times. <laughs> Set a date because if we don't, if we can't keep score, whether we're 20, 30, 40, or 50 on what that end game is and define it, then what are we really working to? Then we do not have the ability to make sound decisions without that goal in mind, right? We're just aimlessly running for, through life, fucking chasing money. And I was doing the exact same thing when I went through my first 23 startups without really intentional purpose behind it. Once I got that in 2015 is when everything in my life absolutely changed. And it's interesting. I got into STRs right as I met John, got him into share my first mastermind uh, that I was a part of. I don't know if you've ever heard of EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, but I left that to start my own called Spark because we all need this spark in our life. And John gave that to us. And so I have financial and life. A lot of people look at church and state. They want to separate business and life. It's the work-life balance. It doesn't work that way. It's together. You cannot separate it. If you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to manage it, right? So it's everything that comes down to how much time I spend with my wife, how many times a week we have sex, how much time we spend without phones with our kids, coaching. And we audit it every single Friday. Every Friday from noon to four, me and my wife go to lunch, we go through and audit all the decisions that we made. I mean, I just put this $1.4 million property under contract yesterday. She hasn't even seen it yet. We're discussing it now, but we'll audit that decision on Friday. Did we move the needle closer in the last seven days to retirement or farther away? And when we have that accountability together, for those of you that are coupled up out there, it makes a huge difference. So your wife, has she, she's obviously involved in the maybe she doesn't know about this property you have under contract yet, but in your previous ventures, have you guys always been partnered? We've been a team kinda... since the day we got, even before we got married. So we started Wild Bill's Texas Smokehouse, our restaurant in California, even before we got married. I was a college golf coach. She ran the restaurant. I ran it with her. We expanded quickly. We sold, but we've been in business together. We are true life and business partners and best friends. We've been married for 25 years. We've never done anything independently. We're best friends. She knows every single thing that goes on. I used to protect her and not share the bad stuff, like when I've had to rob from our savings on a Wednesday to make payroll and then wait for the credit card transactions to come back in the following Tuesday and then pay it back. Now it's an open book, and we talk about those things every single week as we audit our success for the week. 
Okay, because yeah, I just wanted to bring up a point, something I've seen, and I'm constantly, this is, I, I think what's one of the things that's cool about short-term rental spaces is like so new. And, and what I'm seeing is relative to other businesses, you have a lot more husband-wife duos. There's just a natural fit between the husband, I don't want to make generalizations here, but maybe one of the couple running the numbers and then the other one designing. So earlier you said that she was a huge, does, or she, does she have an interior design background or that's just something that she's taken upon herself to learn and get good at while you guys Neither have Neither of us have a in background this. in anything. She has an AA degree. I'm a college dropout. We've learned how to do everything on our own through experience and through life. We've been in, we were drop shipping in e-com and had my first exit before I even met her when I was 24. Before anybody knew what drop shipping, 30 yeah, years ago. I was going to say, what drop shipping 26 years ago? I was what drop was shipping in 1992 then? and 93. And then sold that company to Venus Swimwear. We started, we'd been in the restaurant business. We've been in the ground transportation, the real estate business, the technology, but you name it, we've done just about everything. Family entertainment was our biggest business. So you learn how to run a business. You learn from your mentors. You learn from people like Reginald Booth, who was, I call him the half a billionaire. He's worth five, $600 million. Who was our business partner in Glow Golf and the second franchisee in the Pizza Hut. That's how I learned how to not just create a PL, but to understand PLs and balance sheets from him. And I went through my first 13 years in business without understanding that. My, even like really my first real business outside of selling t shirts with my mom was my golf professional career. And I made 320 grand in my first year after dropping out of UCLA my freshman year. I'm 19 years old. That's a lot of money in the early 90s when you're 19. And I literally just was the guy that would put the receipts because my best man at my wedding was a CPA. He's like, dude, you got to bring me your receipts. And they were in a friggin' shoebox, you know? And then when I saw this ledger, my partner Reg and our Glogol business would hand write on an old school pencil ledger. We didn't have QuickBooks and that type of stuff back then. And then I, he's taught me how to understand it. And I think financial literacy is something that fails our country because we don't really teach financial literacy in high school. And that's something that probably needs to start in middle school or junior high and move into high school. You really have to go into business in college to understand financial literacy. So if somebody's going in and they study English or become a doctor, there's a lot of professionals, a lot of doctors and dentists out there that don't know anything about financial literacy. They don't know anything about investing. And that's something that, that I've tried to bring to this industry from my experience and how I've learned and how I built some pretty good sized companies over 30, $50 million a year, 700 plus employees and tell them why I hate it and why I really focus on small business and why I'm doing, running my portfolio the way that I do. Like people don't join my mastermind, Jeremy, cause they don't want to be held accountable to submit their benchmarks, which is really their P and L's by the 10th of every month because they're too fucking lazy. And if you're too lazy, why the hell would you invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into a business if you're not going to have an intimate relationship with your financials? It's reckless, in my opinion. And these, all these conversations, like that last 45 seconds all started on Clubhouse in, in 2020. And I was the black sheep back then. And a lot of people, especially your age, are looking to co-host, looking to arbitrage, looking for quick bucks. And I think there's a lot of advantages to investing into the long term, if you are financially literate and you understand, you know, the, what I call the back office, the back office is the biggest point that most people don't understand. If I go bankrupt today, I don't have time to recover. I got a daughter going to college in a year. I have another one, four years behind that. I'm supposed to retire in five months. If you went bankrupt today, you have time to recover from that, right? So the investing strategy, and I think the life management strategy is completely different. And this is what John Bairden told me when we had our first meeting with him, we had a guy in his twenties, we had nobody in their thirties. And then we had people in their forties and fifties that were in the group and the financially, the most successful were the guys in their fifties. And so us in the forties strive to be where those guys are at in their fifties. Right. And Tyler, who was in his twenties, he's, I don't want to be like any of you motherfuckers. He's I'm doing a hundred million. Forget you guys with these small 30, $40 million companies. And so we started that eight years ago. Guess where Tyler is today? He's just broke 60 million because he's, he got that roadmap over that three year mm. period that we had this mastermind together. I was gonna say and either in the dumps or he's on top of Mount Everest. He's not, he's those. in the middle <laughs> right now, yeah. but he's ascended farther than any of us besides him believed. Right. And I think that's the thing that our limiting beliefs, people that let people get in their head 
It's other people's thoughts that turn into negative self-talk for us. And that's what ends up holding us back as we start believing that negative self-talk. I'm fortunate that I worked with a sports psychologist named Dr. Bob Rotella when I was young in my late teens and early 20s playing golf. And he taught me the power of self-talk. And you think about what you think about before when you're laying in bed before you go to sleep. Usually there's dreams that correlate around that. And I'm not this whole Tony Robbins stuff, but I believe that we can manifest outcomes by how we think, how we visualize, and how we talk to ourselves. And it's evident when you play a sport like golf, and it's really simple. If anybody plays golf, you don't have to be good or bad. If you look at the tree or you look at the lake or you look at the sand trap and you're trying to avoid it, you're going to hit it in it almost every time. When you pick out a target and you focus on it and you visualize striking it right at that target, it leads to an immense amount of success. So I think I visualize, I've used that same visualization as I've gone through my career. And most importantly, I made it abundantly public on that Kentucky property. I would have never bought it. I didn't buy it, but I would never put it under contract if I didn't have that visualization for what that outcome is and know how to calculate that to revenue and net income. So my question, so you talked about, obviously you like working with folk who can buy, have that I don't want to say are later down their journey, but if you're going to compare it to someone in their 20s, you talk about folk doing co-hosting arbitrage to get starting. I guess what would you what would be your recommendation for someone earlier on in their journey in their 20s? Maybe they have a few thousand dollars saved up, but yeah, they're not they don't have the means or the credit worthiness to go out and buy even a 500k home. What would you recommend for them? Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story about that, Jeremy. Number one, before I tell you the story, is definitely not arbitrage. I think arbitrage is the riskiest investment that we can make. Because if you only have 10 grand and you're going to go sign a lease, even if you can follow Sean's methodology and what he teaches and get a month or two free to generate some cash flow, and you have to spend 6,500 to basically furnish that one bedroom or that economy apartment, you don't have room for scale. And it's risky because you're blowing through all of your cash or at least 60% of it. So I'm a big proponent of co-hosting over arbitrage. Um, you don't own anything in either either realm, right? So why would you want to spend 50, 60% of your cash if you only have 10 grand to your name or 20 grand to your name when you can much easily co-host? Because at the end of the day, you get to pick your property. There's a lot of underperforming properties that are out there, probably about 40, 50% of the properties. That's a huge number. Think about that. Just in... That's about five, 6,000 properties in the Smokies. That's about seven or 8,000 just in the Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, Fort Morgan area. Pick any of these markets. I just released a reel on my Instagram today about how co the markets that people should be targeting for co-hosting. And it's not these apartments in Dallas or in Nashville or Philadelphia or Orlando or wherever it is. Why not go to the freaking beach or to Aspen or Telluride or someplace that's super high dollar and I use the example of like Whitefish or Big Sky because I filmed this when I was in Whitefish, Montana last week. Anybody that knows how to market and price optimize that can halfway eloquently speak to another human being can identify underperforming properties by doing Avery Carl's Enemy Method on Airbnb and Verbo and be able to get in contact and reach out to them. Just go to the county assessor, pull the records, use the Land Glide app, message them through Airbnb, whatever it is to get in front of them. But if you can show them the path to be able to make more money and spend less time, those are the two problems that you have to solve if you are a co-host. The owner wants to make more money and doesn't want to put any time into their property. So if you can show that to them, if you can hand them the case study, right, of how you're going to do it, they're never going to do what you can do. But the number one thing is you need to know how to market. And for marketing for me is listing optimization and off, off platform marketing, email, Facebook ads, social media, text messaging, that's all you need. That's really the four cores that you need to be able to be successful. So a funny story is I think it was December eighth or ninth, literally a 26 year old from Southern California reached out to me. I think he lived in Pasadena and he was trying to get co-hosting deals in Joshua Tree in Indio. He's staying away from Palm Springs. I had about an hour long conversation with him. It was like nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. Actually, it was probably nine o'clock my time, seven o'clock his time. He didn't want to do the call. I said, dude, I don't have any other fucking time and it's going to be for free. Get your ass out of bed and call me. And he called me and we started talking about co-hosting. 
And he's like, man, I really wish you would put a course together. So I spent the next nine and a half hours when I got off the phone with him right here, putting together the ultimate co-host masterclass. That is the most comprehensive thing. At the end of the day, if you can find a property, build a case study, and most importantly, you got to know how to do off-platform marketing, you can crush everybody else. Throw in a little bit of listing optimization, a little bit of pricing optimization manually on top of Price Labs or Wheelhouse, and you'll be good. The acquisition of co-hosting customers, in my opinion, is the easy part if you know what to do. And it costs you zero except for time. Arbitrage, too much risk for me. So when you talk about so co-hosting versus arbitrage, arbitrage, it's like buying in a sense where you're running the numbers, you're analyzing deals, whereas but you co-hosting- don't, you're, you're not buying, you, you're renting, you don't own anything. But still the math equate, it's still a math equation. Where co-hosting, it doesn't matter. You have a, your downside's limited. You know, you're it, getting it a percentage. It absolutely matters. So well, many people don't value their time and they'll take shitty deals. They go get that one bedroom apartment that's gonna do $40,000 a year and they're making eight grand. The same amount of time and skill set and thought process goes into making that eight grand as it does to take a property that's making 200 or you're going to take from 150 to $200,000 a year. And now you're making 40 grand. So when I started, I, and this is one of the tenants in my master classes, I started with a hundred thousand dollars minimum. So I'm going to make 20 grand at 20%. I take two or three. I knew I never wanted to have more than 10 properties. And unfortunately now I have 13. But then I went to 150, then I went to 175. Now I'm $200,000 minimum. I have to make 40K to take on a property. And it's got to be equitable for the owner. I've got to be able to make the owner at least 50. So what I, most people do is they take on too many properties because they get sold by all these co-host guys that are selling master classes and courses. And I do the exact same thing that it's about the number of properties, zero to 500, zero to 100, zero to 50. Hey, I just, my student just closed 27 properties. Who gives a fuck? The reality is how much money are you making and how much time are you investing? Those are the only two things. Because the same thing for you to scale that business is the same thing for me to scale my owned portfolio, except for I've got to have cash to go along with the own, cash and credit to go along with the own portfolio. We only have so much balance. It's why I'm just totally against these huge businesses. I also don't believe there's going to be a huge market to sell. A lot of people that are doing the arbitrage thing and the co-hosting and the management thing thinks that private equity or hedge funds are going to come in and buy up their portfolios. Ask Sonder about that. Ask Vacasa about that. Go in and look at what happened to the guild. And all of those have either struggled or failed within the last nine months or are failing right now. And those guys are not coming in because they know they can go acquire their own properties and then hire people to learn how to do that to put them into place. Yeah. And you also don't physically have, like you said, you don't own anything with arbitrage and transferring. I think, yeah, people have the notion that they can transfer their leases. That's something that's super easy to do. And it's just not the case. There's 99.9% .9 of leases are non-transferable. Co-host agreements though, on the other hand, which I think is unique. And there, ha there was a ton of M&A in co-host businesses or vacation rental management businesses in the last few years, the market for that has definitely dried up a bit. And actually, look at the and struggles I that Vacasa is having right now. They were the leader in M and A and buying all the small mom and pop fifty property to one hundred and fifty property companies around the country, and they just got removed. Is probably or have they already been removed, or is that in a couple of days? Or... Delisted de from yeah, the... exactly. Yeah, they're getting close. <laughs> I think uh, it might be next week. They're going to get delisted, and they're going to be on pink sheets. Yeah, which is crazy. But the point is, there actually was M and A and co hosting and vacation rental management. Arbitrage never. I, I heard that the last deal to buy someone's arbitrage portfolio was like 2019 from like an institutional buyer and it just didn't go well. So if your goal is to like exit, if you're thinking co-hosting or arbitrage is that quote unquote, like get rich quick, build a business, sell it off. Like it has to be vacation rental management. There, it's just the only option, only way you're going to be able to get acquired. My personal, the way I see it is like co-hosting and arbitrage are completely means to an end. Like I'm only, yeah, I'm only taking co-host deals for me if they're lucrative yeah like bigger house a place i already have an operation too i actually own a boat rental business the only place i co-host because there's some obviously synergies there i can rent a boat to my co-host customers or my guests whereas that's an additional income stream or for me i do arbitrage but i cherry pick like for me i'm arbitraging a big house that's going to make serious cash flow 
not these little dingy one bedroom apartments that right. and I think your point is like, yeah, you have five, $10,000. And what is the folk who do that? They go after the one bedroom apartments and they try to arbitrage the one bedroom apartments. And they just, the inventory of one, two bedroom apartments have just boomed. It's, it's gone up a lot. And right. in my opinion, the one, two bedroom apartments are competing with hotels. You don't have a differentiated property or differentiated product. Whereas I'm assuming yours are extremely differentiated from hotels. You talk about all the things you're providing. So if someone could arbitrage your house, obviously you're not going to rent it to them. <laughs> well, that could be a serious cash flow machine if someone was in your situation and for whatever reason wanted to. Yeah. Oh, and I don't there's a lot with- of people that are in that situation because they have shitty property management companies. Right. I, I, a prime example, the last co-hosting account I took over, I started on January 1st of this year. Six bedroom, four bath, beachfront property, Gulf Shores, Alabama, half a mile down from my number one producing house. I'd never met the guy. Just said, hey, I joined your group. I see what you're doing. Do you have any room to co-host? I said, depends. Let me know about Send me the <laughs> link to your property. And this property was did $180,000 a year in 2022. And I know I can do 300 plus, but I quoted them at 245. And I said, I'm going to charge you the same thing that your previous management company did. I'm going to 245, but I need a $50,000 budget. So my wife can redesign everything inside. They gave me 25 this year, 25 next year. We're cool with that. We put it to work the best that we could, you know, and I started co-hosting and on pace to do 330 right now going into the season which that'll escalate probably to 360 to 370 by the time we're done. And I took him off a seven day, Saturday to Saturday, even for a high demand property and moved him to my three, two, one strategy and increased rates across the board by about 21%. So easier to book, faster wins to keep the client happy. They see the progress and what's happening. And one of the things that I would recommend all co-hosts do is that, especially when times are good, send a forecast. So I believe in tracking, right? So track from the day that you started. For me, it's annualized. We started on January 1st. And just track at the end of every month when you send an invoice. So you see, hey, we're 220, or let's just say $120,000 a year to date. We're tracking to do 185. We're at $67,000 to date. We're tracking to do 190. And the goal was, or tracking to do 90. And the goal was 85. So that kind of going back to that life plan, we need a goal to achieve in everything in our life, whether it's retirement, whether it's revenue for a client, cash flow for a client, whatever that is. So we should add those as co-hosts into our reports. Just a little co-hosting tip today. Okay, yeah, and talking about tangible tips. So A, three, two, one strategy. 30 second pitch, what is that? It's for properties that are not booking. I told people to start doing this on April 1st. Specifically at beach markets or any markets that are seven days or five day minimums, move to three days on the weekends, two days on weeknights, and then have the one night gap but raise your pricing on Saturday, on the weekends and on the two days to where you're going to pay for the additional cleanings because you got to add at least one a week, possibly 1.5, 1.75. It gives more flexibility for people to be able to book. People that only want to stay five days aren't going to pay for seven. People that only want to stay for three or four aren't going to pay for that additional fifth day and leave it sitting there. It's just not the way that we work. There's remorse, there's FOMO with that. And then you use that gap day on the, the three And the two, if you have a gap day in mine, have typically ended up on Wednesdays. So you go in and you raise that by 60% and then you discount it by 50% and sell it to either the person checking out or the person checking in to get a late checkout. And I'm not talking like noon checkout or one checkout. Let them check out at five o'clock in the evening so they get a whole extra day on the beach. Or the people, almost every property is getting, hey, can we check in early? Yeah, you can. So what I do is I say, you can check in early up until two. So I'm moving from four to two, hundred percent free. After that, it's 250 bucks to 300 bucks. If you want to check in at noon, or I can do five, six, 700 bucks. If you want to come in starting at midnight. And then they say, what if we paid the 700? Is it possible to come in four or five o'clock the previous night? You know what? I'll bonus that to you. So it's about positioning and selling to them, but that's also key that when you have that gap day, whether it's a one or a two day, that you start selling that about two weeks in advance. So that way you have enough time to give time to the people on the other side to go back and forth. And it's a first come first serve. So I have that set up in hospitable to send out automated if there's a one night gap and it goes to both the checkout and the check-in at the exact same time. Got it. So you essentially try to create that day gap. I'm creating urgency. And then you pin the two people against each other and hey, heads up 
you have the opportunity, but someone else also has it. And then have it, the- it's, I know you're going to want an early check-in is that the, I know like 92% of our guests are asking for early check-ins. And then on the flip side, 92% of our guests are asking for late checkouts. Late check. Hey, I just want to get ahead of the game and let you know, we do have an open day. If you want to book that at a 50% discount, I'm also sending this to the person checking out. I'm also sending this to the person checking in language is like that. And it just allows them. I'm not creating them on purpose. I've only ended up with four through the entire summer from Memorial day to labor day so far. But that's one of the reasons that I'm raising the price by 60% and then discounting 50%. So I still have an additional 10% delta. Beautiful. That was, if you guys write all that down, replay, that's incredibly tangible. And another thing I wanted to touch on, because you're, in my opinion, or the direct marketing, I don't want to use the word guru influencer, but guy, I'll just use direct marketing guy. If you could just quickly say direct marketing 101, how do you get bookings off of Airbnb? Why should you get bookings off of Airbnb? What, like, what would you share? You want to own your customer. If I'm going to sell glass cases, I want to sell them on my own website. I want to sell them at billseyeglasses.com. I don't want to sell them on Amazon because I don't own the customer. It doesn't give me the ability to bring them back. So if anybody knows anything about the unit economics of business, the whole goal is to extend the lifetime value, what we call LTV in a customer. So I use StayFi at every one of my properties. Arthur Coker, you need to start putting me on commission, buddy. <laughs> I get nothing for saying this from Arthur. I love him. I just love his product. I use StayFi. I have bigger properties. It works when you only have four maximum occupancy or six. You can do it even in a one bedroom apartment. It's the same cost essentially as buying Google or an Orbi router. It's like a hundred bucks. So what that does is StayFi captures them. And then I zap that using Zapier right into my marketmystr.com account. And then I have automated funnels that are scheduled, including in those funnels are email, text message, and video that go out to them. So it allows me the opportunity to increase the lifetime value that's extracting more money out of their wallet to get entice them to be able to come back. And I can email them. I set up my funnel one time and market my STR, and then it just goes out to them automatically. So I do the same thing on Airbnb and Verbo, and I actually create lead magnets that go out that I use on social media and even in advertising in my markets for people as well. And you said market my STR for, you just launched this platform and what everything you just talked about is pretty much what it does in one place or what's the 30 second elevator pitch on market my STR. Number one, it hosts all of your properties for your direct booking sites. So if you have something like I use owner res, I can take their direct booking widget, drop it onto the direct booking page and they can book right then and there. Right. So it eliminates the need for a full-blown website. You don't need to spend $2,000, $3,000, $4,000. Unlimited properties, unlimited sales pages. E- all your email marketing, get rid of MailChimp, active campaign, constant contact. Text messaging, get rid of simple texting that cost me 99 bucks. CRM, build full funnels. And you basically, social media management and scheduling and analytics, live chat to go on to your direct booking pages, which increases conversion by 30%. All of that's included in the $97 a month plan. Now, if anybody knows what HubSpot costs, I was customer number 33 at HubSpot in 2007. When I quit HubSpot, I was spending over $4,000 a month. But if you just take MailChimp, lead pages, simple texting, a pipe drive, just not even Salesforce, a basic CRM, you know, and all the other stuff, you're going to be at four to $500 a month. So I've got a tremendous partner, Jeremy, that has allowed me to bring this to market for $97 a month. That's our host package. Yeah, I was about to say, geez, all those integrations. I'm assuming you're not building your own email system. Uh, maybe you are, I don't know. It's all under <laughs> one roof. Yeah. And that's yeah. yeah, that's what makes it, that's what simplifies everything. So you're not bouncing back and forth between tools. And then for $197, you get all the automation and I've already built templates for you. So over 350 templates and you get my personal marketing, a direct booking templates that are inside of that. We're adding some other stuff like email templates and everything that's already written for you as well. And that's in the Superhost program. That's only 197. And then the customer support is just off the chain. Live trainings every Tuesday and Thursday, 24 seven. So it's, it's pretty crazy. So I feel really great because I am a marketer. I built all my companies on the backbone of marketing. I'm a ClickFunnels guy. I've been a HubSpot guy. I've used Sharper Spring. I've never used Confusionsoft, really Infusionsoft. It's called something else now. I don't even know what it's branded as. But it's scary for a lot of people to have to hodgepodge all of these things together, right? So we built it specifically for short-term rental hosts 
to simplify and give them the ability to market. Most of them don't because they don't know where to start and they don't know how to manage it. Okay. And so someone who's looking, they just market my str.com. That's the domain. That's it. Market my str.com. Beautiful well, guys. Definitely check it out. And just to put context, like a hundred dollars, if it's a hundred dollars a month, what's Airbnb's, what's their, dir- what's their direct fee? It's, or their fee is what? 14% to the guest and 3% to the host. So 17 to 20 ish percent overall. So if you think about that, if you did even a hundred dollars divided by 0.2, that's like a $500 booking. Obviously you're saving your guest money. You're also making more yourself, but in this game, like there is a huge amount of money lost through these, through these OTAs, through Airbnb, Verbo, and those sites. So really, if it's something you're not doing already, it's, not, it's something that you should be doing, whether you do it with, through a rental agreement that you just send them a paper and make them Zelle or PayPal you, however you do it, obviously you probably want to automate and scale it and check out Mark and my STR, the direct booking platforms, but it's just something that over time, you know, that's just going to add up to thousands, tens of thousands over a lifespan, maybe a hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So really thank you, Bill, for bringing that to their attention. Yeah. Regardless of what platform you utilize, Bootsly, marketmystr.com, HubSpot, whatever. The most important thing as a business owner that I've learned in my 31 plus years is building our email list. It's the most valuable tool that we have from a sales and marketing standpoint. And that's why I'm a huge fan of StayFi as well, because it just, it throws fuel on the fire. You can go at five to seven times faster than just getting that one email, the booker, every And, and StayFi is, for those who don't know, it's the Wi-Fi where just, yeah, how, how does it work uh, logistically? It's just like Starbucks or a hotel where you have to, you have a splash page, Bill's STR, and then you put in your first name, last name, email address, and that's how they gain access. So all the guests have to sign into it as well. For those of you that think that's an inconvenience and guests are going to get pissed, never had one complaint. The gra- you have to do it on an airline if you want to get access to Southwest or United Wi-Fi. You have to do it at Starbucks. You have to do it at JW Marriott, Hilton Best Western, wherever it is. It's very commonplace today. And you're providing complimentary. I stayed at a Westin the other night and it was like, unless you're a Marriott Bonvoy member, you've got to spend like $9. And for me, honestly, getting my credit card out and doing that just pissed me off. I don't want to even take the time to to do that that's not like the nine dollars doesn't matter it's the you it's just the annoyance. become a bonvoy member yeah that's what i looked into it i was like nope i'm not doing it i'm not doing it i'm an airbnb guy i know you don't stay at airbnbs but i pretty much strictly unless it's just like me and my girlfriend i'll probably stay at an airbnb but i digress there so bill what i like to share at the end of these is what separates the pros from the amateurs like if you're just going to share something tangible that because yes in this game a lot of people are killing it doing really well and some folk, they get in and they maybe they see something online, they watch someone's video and they follow somebody in somewhere. And next thing they know, they get in a little bit over their head. But what separates the pros from the amateur in the short-term rental game? I'd say there's really three things. Number one is having a business plan before you go in that you can follow. And business plans are just for our own exercise. It's not like you're handing it to a bank or anything, but really having a plan going in of why you're getting into this, why you're buying an individual property, how much you plan on making out of it, how much time you're going to have to invest, what are the risks? Number two is really the property evaluation. I see people that can pick properties well are the ones that set themselves up for success. And then number three is marketing. Marketing is the biggest separator, in my opinion. I'm able to take on co-hosting clients because I would never buy these properties that are average 50 to 75th percentile properties, like within AirDNA, and turn them into 120, 130, 140%. And a lot of it's because of the marketing. There's a lot of components that go into this business. It's not just set it and forget it anymore. So have a business plan, learn how to, the true deep analysis on how to purchase a property or rent a property or co-host a property. Cause you need to know how to do that, whether you're arbitraging, co-hosting, managing, or buying and investing. And then three, you really need to invest into your marketing skills. Marketing's the one that moves the needle most that I see Jeremy after somebody has already purchased a property. So you're not just relying on Airbnb and Verbo. We want to own our customers and own our own outcome. Okay. So it's really front end. Do your work on the front end. Make sure you analyze the property. Make sure you have a business plan. And some I think that I'm taking away from Bill is more the life planning. I will say that I, every property I look at, I underwrite it and I, but in terms of my life, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what 30 years from now, I got to figure that one out maybe or see how everything I'm doing fits into the, the greater scheme of things. But then start on a daily basis right here, my friend. (laughs)
Guys, Holy for those shit. of you guys, oh my goodness, for those of you guys looking, he's got a paper planner. Jeez you Louise, hold, I didn't know those existed. Accountable. It's the Bill Faith Success Planner, not available in stores, everybody, but this is what fundamentally changed my life. That way I can audit every day and audit with my wife on a weekly basis. Pen and paper, stick to the basics. Bill, thank you so much for coming. Where can, you know, if they don't already know you and know what you got going on, where can they, where can everyone listen and find you? Bill Faith 73, that's F-A-E-T-H, Bill Faith 73 on Instagram, Be Faith everywhere else on social. I'm on TikTok, Facebook, probably my biggest value driver, get into my Facebook group, Build Short-Term Rental Wealth. We have a Facebook page. We've got all the social, but my Facebook group on Build STR Wealth, that's probably the most valuable digital component to be in. Yeah, his Facebook group is great. I've been in it for a couple months now. And also, yeah, your conference. Where can they find it? Bill has the best. I'll, I haven't been to everyone's conferences, but I would say I really enjoyed and really enjoyed STR Wealth. But yeah, where could they find information if they want to physically meet up in person and want to know more about the, the conference in Nashville? Yeah, it's the strwealthcon.com. It's the STR Wealth Conference. It's the largest STR-specific conference in our industry. We sold out in three weeks last year. We'll have, we're tripling the size of the venue. It's a little bit bigger this year. <laughs> we're going to do 3,000 people this year. We've tripled the size of the venue. We'll triple the size of attendees. I have a lot of cool stuff. Damon John from Shark Tank, FUBU, and Real Estate Investors, one of our keynote speakers, will be announcing another one in September that's even bigger than the people Shark, Damon John, believe it or not. But we just really try to value on education, all facets co-hosting, investing, long-term planning, all this stuff, marketing. We're going to have a couple of new tracks. It'll be in Nashville February 5th through the 8th. February 5th through the 8th right here in Nashville. strwealthcon.com. And guys, I will be there. So when you're there, come and let's hang out because it was a lot of fun last year and I'm sure it'll be next year as well. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for coming, Bill. Until next time. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate you having me.